Becoming an esports pro is a dream career for plenty of people all across the globe. The idea of being able to play your favorite video game professionally while also making millions of dollars in the process is almost too good to be true, but the reality is, nowadays, that's a totally viable career path. For the most talented players in a game, plenty find themselves enjoying long careers with healthy salaries and a chance to leave behind an impressive legacy. It's hard to imagine someone who wouldn't choose to go down this path in life if given the chance, but that's the story we have for you today. In League of Legends, one of the greatest Western prodigies of all time had one of the shortest careers we've ever seen. He was a top laner who had the talent to build a decade-long legacy for himself but instead chose to walk away from the game right as he was entering his prime? This is a story that includes roster implosions, LCS disqualifications, and the greatest super team that never was, and it all goes back to a kid who would rather join the military than play League of Legends. This is the story of Zoro Zero. This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Now, you guys know Surfshark at this point. They're a VPN provider who's been a continued partner on our channel for a while. They have a VPN service that's pretty much unmatched in terms of features when it comes to being stacked up against their competitors. But they really mean a lot more to me these days since their service is something I find myself genuinely using more and more frequently. You guys know I have carpal tunnel syndrome, which has been preventing me from playing many video games in my free time, which means I've been spending more and more time doing stuff like trying to learn languages, which has never been easier since Surfshark Sharks of VPN allows me to see all the local region locked content from pretty much any country in the world I want. For the videos I'm making, I can often find myself on some old sketchy websites trying to dig up resources from gaming history, which can be a bit scary at times, but thanks to Surfshark I get an extra layer of encryption to help protect me. From something as complex as trying to ensure privacy, not letting your ISP spy on what you're browsing, to something as simple as just wanting to watch your favorite TV show that's on a different region's Netflix, Surfshark really does provide a lot, and if you sign up using my code today, you can get a pretty sweet deal. Just click the link in the description down below and use code GBay99 at checkout to get 83% off your order, plus three months free, the best deal that they currently offer. It helps support me, obviously, but Surfshark really does have a seriously great product, so I highly recommend you give them a shot. One of the most eventful years in League of Legends history was 2013, when Riot Games first started the LCS in North America and Europe. Gone were the days of independent tournaments scattered across the year with inconsistent rule sets and qualifying structures. From now on, League of Legends would aim to be more like a real sport. Official leagues would pop up all over the world with regular seasons and playoff structures that hoped to mimic what you see in traditional athletic competition. It was an exciting time as most fans back then just wanted a more sustainable and viable ecosystem for their favorite players and teams to survive in. But not all teams were up to the task of competition. If I were to describe the first year of LCS in just a phrase, I would use two words, dynasties and disappointments. The level of quality from team to team within LCS leagues varied pretty wildly at first. Some teams made winning look easy and started dynasties that last even to this day, while others played so poorly it looked like they wouldn't be able to win a game to save their lives. This is why we had promotion and relegation for the first five seasons of competition. If you were a team who finished poorly at the end of a split, then you would have to play through a relegation series against the best teams coming from the amateur scene. Winner got a spot in LCS. CS. This system worked pretty well at first, as it allowed new talented players to constantly filter into the LCS whenever a poorly placing team wasn't up to snuff anymore. But as time went on, fewer and fewer amateur teams were really able to compete. Even some of the best amateur stars with future LCS talent on their roster couldn't make a dent against some of the worst professional teams imaginable. It should go without saying the challengers in these scenarios do have the odds stacked against them pretty heavily. However bad an LCS team was, they were still a multi-million dollar brand who could spend loads of cash on players and coaches. Amateur teams by comparison were normally just five solo queue players who came together and invented a goofy name. If you were an amateur team, you would have to have a seriously large amount of talent to knock off a professional LCS squad and make it to the show yourself. But every once in a while, a team was talented enough to do just that. 
Sinners never sleep, taking down against all authority and earning their place in the European LCS. After the very first split of LCS, we saw a somewhat legendary organization in Against All Authority get completely overpowered by a random amateur squad who played under the name Sinners Never Sleep. This team, who eventually rebranded to Lemon Dogs, was the brainchild of coach and manager Inner Flame, a bright mind in the league scene who still works as an analyst for SK Gaming today. The roster was made up of almost all new faces to the pro scene, but had proved themselves in a few amateur events prior to this. In fact, the team finished top two in every single tournament they had entered up until this point, apart from one where they forfeited after their roster wasn't able to make it to their game. League fans from Europe probably know a lot of the faces on this team as a few modern day stars first got their professional careers kickstarted here. Tabs, Nuke Duck, Mithy, and Dexter were all talented players that would go on to have long careers, some of which are still playing or working in the scene today. But amongst all this talent, there was one player who stood out. The top laner for Lemon Dogs was an 18-year-old Danish kid who went by the name Zoro Zero. Real name Morten Rosenquist, Zoro didn't seem like much of a standout compared to the rest of his peers at first. The entirety of the Lemon Dogs roster worked together as a cohesive unit to win promotion into the LCS, and once in LCS, these rookies experienced some growing pains together, as in their first few games, they struggled a bit adjusting to the new level of talent they were now facing. While the team was able to win some games, they understandably lost more, and after three weeks into their first split, they had put together a relatively mediocre four and six record falling pretty far down the standings, but that's when something clicked. Kilmer right now is being ganked to this top lane by Dexter. Yeah, he's actually gonna try and go yeah, away from this one and he is gonna pull up here, but chance of escape, not gonna happen for him. First blood coming down there and he was caught out. Running onto tabs, took the wrong turn, comes in, they do manage to get the belly slam down, but look at the damage already turning back around. He just hit, he's gone down like roadkill. Slippery, he just managed to get the head of Arrow, but look at that, Dexter just comes in, he's gonna be burning down, they're gonna catch on towards Alex Seasley, will he be enough? No, the crescendo comes across, it's a double kill for Dexter, he's gonna get on towards Darker as well, it should be another kill. I don't know, I, honestly, I'm, I'm pressed, I'm struggling to find any answers right now as to where this Lemon Dogs team has come from. Lemon Dogs had figured something out and were quickly rising on a trajectory that would go on to place them as one of the best teams in all of Europe. Shortly into the split, the team realized that their top laner Zoro Zero was so talented he could mostly be left to fend for himself. Zoro would seemingly always win his own lane in dominating fashion and even had enough time left over to go and win his teammates' lanes for them as well. Especially with the blue buff, he loves to push as much as possible. He went Ninja Tower, but Zoro is coming from the back. They're trying to go for a kill on him. They do manage to put the death mark down. It will pop him where he stands. His passive was not available. And just like that, they wipe Anivia off the map. All of Lemon Dog's roster was talented and able to build advantages for themselves in kills and CS, but few saw such dominating performances as Zoro's Zero did top lane. Even with the rough start to begin the year, Zoro would finish the split above two-thirds kill participation, getting the highest CS per minute and the highest average goal share of any top laner in the EU LCS. Stats can be a fickle thing in League of Legends, so maybe it's more impressive to just say that Zoro was the star player who helped carry his team to a first place finish in Lemon Dog's very first split. A rookie team having this kind of explosive success was pretty uncanny. They were bound to see some level of come down, which came in the form of a second place finish in the following playoffs, but this still marked the birth of a new dynasty led by a talented top lane prodigy who still had so much more to show the world the second place finish in playoffs qualified Lemon Dogs for that year's World Championship, which was an achievement unto itself. I don't think I have to tell you that for anyone to go from the amateur scene at the start of the year to Worlds the very next fall, well, that's insanely impressive. The team would experience many highs and lows at that World Championship, most of the highs being credited to Zoro himself. Leading up to the event, when all teams competing moved to North America to practice and participate, Zoro would get Challenger on the North American servers faster than anyone else, getting better records and a better win-loss ratio than even Faker himself. 
The actual event of Worlds didn't go quite as well for the team, although that might have not been entirely their fault. That year's World Championship had a fairly strange structure to it that included a group stage consisting of two groups of five. Although Lemon Dogs finished third in their group, that would still be enough to send them home as just the top two teams made it out. Lemon Dogs got the short end of the stick here as they had two powerhouse teams in their group who were all but predestined to finish in standings ahead of them. Even so, this was a valuable experience for the team as it provided international practice for a roster that was still made up of almost all rookies. During most of the games played, Zoro Zero was able to successfully go toe-to-toe -to -toe against world-class top laners which included a few games where he outright carried his team to victories the same way he did back in Europe. Things were looking up for the squad as their superstar top was developing well, and they would likely be favorites to win in Europe next split. The future couldn't be brighter for the org, which made the headlines we all saw the next day incredibly stunning. Less than a year after forming officially, Lemon Dogs decided to split up. This decision seemed to come from Discord in their roster, as apparently a few players believed they could accomplish more apart than they ever could together. Specifically, the team's jungler Dexter would leave to go play for the legendary North American organization CLG after he expressed discontent having to play in a super supportive playstyle around mid lane. Lemon Dog Sadie Carrie Tabs would also move on, playing for Alliance in Europe, which was a pretty impressive org and move in its own right. The remaining players would stay together and continue competing as a unit, although it wouldn't be on Lemon Dogs as there was something interesting going on behind the scenes at the time. Shortly after Worlds, a major deal would occur between the Lemon Dogs roster and another EU LCS team, Ninjas in Pajamas. NIP was coming off a disappointing summer performance that sent them into a relegation series, but they were still a pretty large and rich organization who had a foothold in other esports like Counter-Strike. Being the influential esports org that they were, they hoped to use some of their financial success to find a solution. This resulted in NIP buying out what remained of the Lemon Dogs roster, signing Zoro Zero, Nuke Duck, Mithy, and the team's substitute Mr. Rales. This created a bit of confusion amongst fans who thought that NIP was buying the Lemon Dogs organization itself, but that wasn't the case. These remained two separate teams, which meant that NIP, after their previous poor performance, would still have to play through their promotion relegation series. With a newly acquired roster consisting of many first place finishers from the previous split, everyone thought it was basically a formality for NIP to re-qualify. They would end up facing an all-Polish roster named Kiedysh Mialem Team. Almost all national teams like this have very rarely had any success against multinational squads in Europe throughout League of Legends history, and couple that with the raw talent and superstardom NIP had, not many people gave KMT a chance. But and they're just gonna catch it. Double kill by Nidalee. This could be it, D-Man. Well, Ninjas in Pajamas suddenly turned this game on its head and KMT drive through their base. It was NIP that were looking, but it was KMT that found them. And this is Ninjas in Pajamas going out of the LCS. We have ourselves a second new team, ladies and gentlemen. It is KMT. In what might have been the greatest upset of season three, NIP got swept three games to zero by KMT. This Polish squad actually turned out to be much better than people gave them credit for as they were led by young superstars Vander and Jankos, who of course would go on to have massive success in EU even to this day, but in 2014, nobody saw this coming. It felt like a tragedy to see the former first place finishers sent down to the amateur circuit, but it turns out they would still get a second chance. While all of this was going on, Lemon Dogs was busy making some pretty big mistakes mistakes in how they handled the start of 2014. After their original roster was released, the team would put together a new roster to compete. This team was featured at the Battle of the Atlantic 2013 between North America and Europe, but performed pretty poorly. So around this time, rumors started floating that management might be looking to sell. I don't believe this has ever been confirmed, but the rumor was Lemon Dogs wanted out and were looking to sell the organization along with the LCS spot. And if true, that 
that might explain what happened next. Leading up to the 2014 spring split, Lemon Dogs wouldn't submit proper paperwork to register their new lineup for the team. They would be hounded by Riot multiple times to do so, but simply never did, possibly because they were so focused on selling the organization, they didn't think they'd be around to compete anyway. But because they missed out on a few deadlines, Lemon Dogs would be forcibly removed from the EU LCS entirely. This meant that there was one opening left, and the three losing squads from the previous promotion stage would be given a second shot in a one-time only play-in. NIP were now given a chance where on January 11th, they were slated to kick off this event, and with just a few victories, they could still qualify for LCS, but by the time their first game rolled around, they didn't show up. When it was their time to play, NIP couldn't field a full lineup. This wasn't a live event, but rather was played online with players competing from their home computers. And it turned out that Zoro Zero hadn't updated his client in a while. He was waiting for a patch to download, which took so long that it disqualified NIP from this event. The team would now be sent back down to the amateur scene. This was obviously a huge disappointment for the squad, but they'd soldier on and continue working towards improvement and requalification. The extra time in amateur might have been a blessing in disguise, especially for their top laner Zoro, who immediately redeemed himself for that faux pas. See, this was the period of time in League history when top lane first switched metas. Up until this point, top had been pretty exclusively a carry role, where bruiser specialists like Hotshot GG and Wicked could single-handedly take over a game, as well as mage mains like Shushe or Xpeke. A lot of the players from this time period are fondly remembered, even to this day, for how talented they were in their ability to carry games, but Season 4 brought all of that to an end. A series of balance changes took place over the year that resulted in carry champions becoming less viable in favor of tanks. Suddenly, these hard carry specialists had to completely reinvent and adjust their playstyles if they wanted to remain relevant, which a lot of them couldn't. This marked the decline and eventual downfall of many early season stars, which resulted in a lot of these guys retiring, but not Zoro Zero. Somehow Zoro became even better than he was before in this new tank meta. He was able to seamlessly transition the way he applied pressure with carry-oriented bruisers and mages into doing the exact same thing with tanks. In a time when most top laners were getting worse, Zoro got better, suggesting that his best play was yet to come. NIP would go on to win almost everything they entered in the 2014 Spring Amateur Circuit, only not getting first place in a few events. When the team did come up short, Zero Zero was still a shining beacon of talent, even winning his lane in these lost games. He was growing as a person and as a player, reaching new heights that left a lot of people excited to continue watching his career with interest. By the end of Spring, NIP had easily cruised to qualify for promotion as the number one team coming from Amateur, meaning meaning they would be going up against the last place team from the LCS's previous split millennium. NIP's victory seemed all but predestined after a complete stomp in game one that saw Zoro Zero getting a perfect KDA with nearly perfect play. Game two was headed in the same direction, signifying we might be in store for a clean 3-0 sweep, but this time, Millennium was able to stall the game out. Even though NIP had a 20k gold lead for most of the game, they couldn't close the match out until the 71 minute mark when they made a mistake. You got a they should be in the tower for Millennium. Yeah, they are gonna throw in that damage coming up towards Kevin. They dive in towards the backside. There's this Mithy that's right in the middle of them. He may just go down. He will fall. Freezes at half HP. Zoro Zero has gone down as well. It's now a five versus three. This is surely it for Millennium. NIP have to flash away. And Millennium after wow. 72 minutes. And what feels like an eternity hiding inside their base. Turn it around and pick up games. This may have rattled the team a bit, as they would end up dropping the next game as well, but they would still rebound in a dominating fashion to win Game 4, tying the series up and getting momentum back on their side. Zoro Zero had crushed his lane in pretty much every single one of these games for what it's worth, even though his top lane counterpart was getting to pick way more useful late game scaling champions like Jax and Ryze, he was doing a really good job of shutting him down for as long as possible and still being as useful as he possibly 
could be. Still, his fate, along with the rest of Nips, would rest in the hands of this single game five. He's still inside of that brush, and here they are. They're gonna come in, they've managed to land the dog finding on towards Mitty. They're gonna force him to flash her, surely, or will he just go down? One more auto attack will do it, and it's the first blood coming in for Irelia. Meanwhile, Carnex. This is bad news for Jerry. He, of course, uses Flash in that last encounter. Mithy going to come into this one. Ross is going to throw down the ultimate. Doesn't even need to. Jerry does go down in the end. The call it from Freeze. From going back, the chain's actually missing. The ultimate here to get a bit more damage down. There's the dive in. Deathmark going to go out, but I think Nuka's going to die. Slow comes out. Oh, Connex got ignite. too deep. The Ignite ticking away. Oh, oh he got he's got him. Wow. Just enough damage from Nuka. With the fight. He is at the front, but the Baron's already gone down. Millennium picked that one up. Are they going to look for the fight? There is actually the jumping. I'm not sure that Missy really wants that one. They're going to blow him to pieces. It's Jay Ree that gets a kill in the end. Victory here as the inhibitor goes down to half. They're going to go towards Creatine. There is the damage coming in. Good black shield. And now Zoro Zero has to back away. Carnex down to less than half. Alberto is going to be able to walk off. But now Zoro Zero flashes. Mithy is going to fall. It's now five versus four. Millennium go on to the Nexus turret yes, themselves. Nuka does come across. He's going to go for Creatine. But he's dead. As Zoro Zero gets game. his GA pop. That is going to be game here for Millennium. They get another kill. The Nexus turrets are already down. There's a shutdown coming in for Kevin at the end and only the Nexus stands and there it is Millennium win the game three to two and secure their spot in the LCS summer split. Following the disappointing performance NIP would release most of their roster including Zoro Zero. Although he was a part of a team that had just failed to qualify for the EU LCS twice, his future still seemed incredibly bright as the greater League of Legends community was able to immediately recognize how good he had become. Both casual fans as well as other pro players recognized that he could very well be one of the best Western top laners in the scene right now. Shortly after becoming a free agent, Wicked, who was one of the best top laners in Europe up until that point, was quoted as saying, If I was forced to step down and had to find a replacement for myself, I would want Zoro Zero. He's the toughest player I've ever faced, and I'm saying that while having competed at OGN and Worlds. It seemed all but inevitable that Zoro would soon be on another team, as a few rumors started floating around about where exactly he might land. Before long, it was all but confirmed that Zoro would be forming a super team with CLG. Counter Logic Gaming had an impressive history up until that point and was coming off a third place finish in the NALCS, but had one glaring flaw in top lane. The team had a storied history with Hotshot GG previously being their top laner, who at one point was arguably the best top in the world. But after he retired from dealing with the tank meta, the team was floundering a bit with the position. They had most recently role swapped an AD carry player named Nian Tanso to top lane and had been playing with him for a while. Nian had shown some promise in the role and had a lot of great games, but he was also starting to suffer from the tank meta and wasn't performing up to the quality of the rest of the team. An upgrade like Zoro Zero would create a team that would immediately become championship contenders in North America, as he might be the missing puzzle piece. This move made sense for other reasons as well, like Zoro would be able to reunite with his old Lemon Dogs buddy Dexter, who of course had joined the team earlier and had been playing jungle for them ever since. To reunite with his old friend, join one of the biggest brands in the world, and finally get to compete in a top league again, that was a very sweet deal being being offered. It seemed all but confirmed that Zoro would be headed over to North America, especially after a few teasing tweets suggesting that he was going off to a new exciting opportunity. Everyone's hype train was blasting full steam ahead when suddenly news broke that the deal was cancelled. Zoro Zero wasn't only not joining CLG, but he was taking a break from competitive League of Legends. This was announced by OnGamers.com, which had an interview with Zoro that detailed the multitude of reasons for his decision. Amongst the many listed, Zoro Zero wanted to go back to school as he was one year off from graduating. He also said that he believed moving to North America would lead him to miss family and friends, and stated that CLG's larger-than-life brand didn't tempt him as much as others had thought. Zoro would conclude the interview by saying that he's not done for good and floated the idea of returning to the scene after 
his studying concluded. As disappointing as this was, it still generated a bit of excitement for when he'd come back and which team he would end up joining. Fans didn't have to wait long before getting excited, as after about six months of studying, Zoro started making a tentative return to League, he started by streaming a climb back up to Challenger on Twitch, where everyone in the community quickly remembered his talent as he rocketed up the solo queue ladder incredibly fast, proving he hadn't lost much luster and his best years were still ahead. Other pros built further on this hype, like Wicked, who repeated in another AMA, Zoro Zero is still the best top laner that I had the most problems laning against. It always felt like I was fighting uphill. Before long, LCS teams began floating offers to Zoro, leaving the community to wait and see where he'd choose to go. First, Elements in Europe made a bid to try and pick him up, which seemed like the most likely candidate to sign him. This was a team that consisted of the remnants of Alliance, who had won an LCS split not long ago and had a pretty stacked roster. It seemed like a perfect fit for Zoro specifically, as once again he would be able to reunite with old teammates Dexter and Tabs, who were playing for the squad at the time. But then, a Brazilian team named Pain Gaming came in out of nowhere and apparently outbid Elements. Soon, news outlets were reporting that Zoro Zero would be continuing his career by moving off to Brazil, which seemed to be confirmed by Zoro himself in a tweet that came out shortly after the news broke. But then, it turned out this move to Brazil was only an offer, but Zoro Zero had turned it down. Zoro, in fact, was not making a return. This tweet in retrospect was simply mocking the reporting of this supposed move rather than confirming it. And sadly, this was the last we've heard of him. After this tweet, Zoro wouldn't ever post on his Twitter again. He wouldn't stream or interact with the community in any way. He ghosted everyone, leaving fellow pros and fans in the dark wondering what he was up to, and we wouldn't get an answer to that for a while. A few fans believed that there might still be a shot he could return and recapture some of his old magic, that is, until esports journalist Thorin interviewed his old teammate Nuke Duck, who let us all know that he wasn't coming back. Is there a a reason? Do you, like, do you think we'll ever see Zoro Zero as a pro player again? No. Does it surprise you he's just never come back? No, no he will never come back. He's, Why he, not? He's in the army now and he's like living real life. Like he, okay. he barely even plays other games too anymore. Like, it will be a miracle if you see him back. A Christmas, Christmas miracle. Looking back on it now, it was incredibly strange to see how all this unfolded. One of the best players in League history, who many called the next great top lane prodigy, walked away from the game right when he was playing at his peak and when League was gaining more relevancy and opportunity than ever. We can only guess why he chose to do so. On the one hand, there's something funny to be said that a Prodigy League player would rather join the military than play League of Legends professionally. But on the other hand, I think it's genuinely sad to see a great pro's potential never get realized. Nevertheless, one thing we can say is, it's certainly admirable to see someone give up fame, riches, and glory for what he probably saw as just a more honest life. Thanks for watching.